Let's talk about Bitcoin. Right? Let's bring it up. Let's talk about exponentials. If we got to talk about Bitcoin. We talk about exponentials. I know. I know. Like a lot. Like a lot. A lot of people are thinking. It's like, look, the law of big numbers. It's a lot harder from Bitcoin to get from you know from twenty eight thousand to one hundred thousand than it was from a dollar to ten dollars, right? Um, so I, I guess you know the question is. You know, are we are we too late to Bitcoin? And then I'm going to ask Opti the same question. I, I don't think I've, I've heard his answer on that. Yeah, well, I, I think to add to Opti's point, and I, I love what you were doing by showing the, the Bitcoin price chart in both log and linear scale, because I think that's the exact point. And and sometimes when I show that to people, they say, oh, that's cheating. You can't do that. That's, that's not fair or whatever. That's, you know, and my my counter argument to that would be that it's just how reality works in like every facet of science, every facet of physics and chemistry, you know, reality is in exponential terms. Our, our understanding of reality is in linear terms, but reality is in exponential terms. You know, we are here, um, you know, a human's like two meters tall or so, but if you look down and you zoom in and farther and farther and farther down to molecules and cells and, and, and plank lengths and quarks, you know, that just tiny things, there are so many orders of magnitude smaller below us. And likewise, if you look outwards to the sky, if you look, you know, to, to space, there are so many orders of magnitude out beyond us. You know, we're ironically kind of in the middle here between, you know, the tiniest thing that we can conceptualize and the whole observable universe. We're like more or less in the middle. And, and it's, it's the same thing. If, if you want to map out the total size of galaxies, the total mass or, or, de or, you know, the total mass of, black holes, you know, you have to talk in logarithmic terms, because if you map them on linear terms, it's like, well, the largest one just dwarfs everything else. So it doesn't become useful. You know, no visualization is useful on a linear scale. If you want to map anything in space or you map anything in a microscopic world. And it, it's the same thing here with Bitcoin, it's the same thing with value. It's the same thing with technology that we have to think in, in logarithmic terms. So I, I think, I think that's one of the most important things for people to see with their own eyes that if you look at it in a linear chart, it's always going to look like it's a bubble and then it's dead and that's a bubble and it's a dead a bubble and a dead forever. And, and this goes to your question, which I'll get to in just a moment. But then if you look at it on a logarithmic scale, you see, Oh, okay. This is following a hyperbolic adoption curve as all technologies do is just for the first time we are pricing a technology in a given number. You know, it's like when people, first invented the light bulb or mass producing the light bulb it's like there was no fixed number that all the light bulbs in the world was equated to that you can then check 24 7 on your you know smart device uh, in your hand <laughs> all the time at 3 a.m as you worry about if you lost all your money <laughs> that, that we've never had that before it's all conceptual it's, it's never been something tangible like that that we can see but with bitcoin because of, of the nature of the technology that's just how it is that there is a fixed number there is a given number that we're pricing them all within. And because we see that, we assume it has to be linear like everything else in our life we see, when in reality it's exponential like everything has been before it. So I think I think that's really important for people to understand that this is true in all of nature. Um, but then when it comes to your question of are we too late? Well, if what I just said is correct, then absolutely not, we're not too late. And I, I think th the most, frankly, painfully obvious example of that is like, how many people do you know in your everyday life that talk about Bitcoin, think about Bitcoin, understand anything about Bitcoin? How, how many people walking down the street can tell you what the difficulty adjustment is? How, how many can tell you the difference between proof of work and proof of stake? How many know the name Hal Finney? It's like people don't know. And if, if we assume that this technology becomes adopted, well then, okay, 99, 99.5, 99.3, whatever percent of the world is yet to adopt it. And so Put aside Bitcoin price, put aside price history, put aside having cycles, put aside everything else. Just that alone should tell you that it's stupendously early. Uh, you know, what, I was in Fenway Park recently in, in Boston with two other Bitcoiners. And for like an hour, we were debating in, in this arena, you know, like 30,000 people or so. How many of them actually own Bitcoin with their own keys or own self-custody? You know, like a non-negligible what? You know, non-negligible amount, like a hundred bucks worth of Bitcoin or so. And, you know, we were like debating like, okay, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, maybe it's three. And it's like, no matter what, we just kept laughing ourselves silly because it's like in this whole, you know, it, it, it's, 
it's one thing to look at a number, 30,000 people, and see a bunch of zeros, like, like you're bringing up, Opti. You know, it's one thing to see the zeros. It's another to sit there with the park and actually see the people and be like, wow, there's like at least 29,950 people here that don't know anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> And and if you continue Bitcoin's adoption curve over the next 30 years, it's like they're probably all going to eventually learn about it. So and anyway, yeah, no, I, I don't think it's too late. And I think one more one more point I'd like to say there, and I think this will be really interesting uh, to people when thinking about exponentials and wealth and everything like that, would be that if we just look at today and we were to say that the poorest people in the world on, on average, say, have about ten thousand dollars USD of net assets. So maybe they're in the developing world, they have minimal, they have, um, you know, not the best housing situation, maybe they have um, a scooter or some other form of transportation, uh, much less privileged. And we are here in the West, you know, let's say, you know, there's a couple billion people that have $10,000 of assets in, in total, if they liquidated everything. And then let's also assume that on the other far end of the spectrum, the very far left end of the bell curve, <laughs> not in intelligence, but in wealth, uh, we're talking about someone with a trillion dollars. And I know some people may not think there are trillionaires out there, but I think, you know, most of us know that it's a high probability there's at least one trillionaire out there in the world. Uh, you know, Elon Musk is the public uh, most wealthy person in the world, but, you know, that's just because he's public. But anyway, if we assume that's a spectrum, it's like someone with $100 million US is like in the middle between those two extremes. And so it's like, if you want to look at someone that, is has like food insecurity is just getting by you know maybe making three dollars us a day between that level of wealth versus someone with a hundred million dollars us is like the same disparity in wealth between that person and the wealthiest person in the world or again to use a fenway park or a stadium metaphor it's like you know let's say we take the assumptions and the estimates to be correct and there's roughly you know 50 to 80 thousand uh 100 million 100 million millionaires, you know, like if we assume there are 50 to 80,000 people out there with a net worth of $100 million or more, you know, basically if you took all those wealthy, stupidly rich and wealthy people, put them in a single stadium, there is just as much wealth and equality within the stadium as there is between the bottom tier of the stadium and everyone else in the world. And so all that to say is that, is it too late for Bitcoins? Like, well, it's easy for our brains to think we're too late because we look at Michael Saylor, we look at people that bought in 2013 or 2012 or 2011 or 2017 or 2019, and we think that, oh, we're too late because they have 10, 100, 1,000 times more sats than we do or, or so much more Bitcoin than we do. There's no way we could ever possibly catch up. And there's no way. And my metaphor with the stadium there is to emphasize on that point that it's like, yes, you will never have as much Bitcoin as Michael Saylor. He'll probably have somewhere between 10,000 and a million times more Bitcoin than you ever will. And, you know, maybe it's even more dramatic than that. But it's like, if you're buying today, probably you will have thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of times more Bitcoin than the average person will in the future. And that's well, that. Yeah, no, and, and it's just, I, I, I'm fascinated by this conversation. And, and like, uh, Luke, when, when we talked, that was the thing that literally stuck with me. It's like the... Yeah. The the exponentials, man. This is where it's, it all boils down to this. Um, but why are you so sure? Why are you so sure about Bitcoin? Why, like, what you you're you're talking an absolute. And again, I, and the only reason I'm giving you pushback is Opti. I know Opti and I feel the exact same way. It is absolute to us. I hope that you're enjoying this video, and I hope that after this video that you begin taking self custody of your Bitcoin, as that is extremely important. And that also includes keeping very good care of your seed phrase and not just writing it on a piece of paper. So I encourage you to check out this video's sponsor, Stamp Seed. Say goodbye to storing your seed phrase on paper and electronic devices, right? With Stamp Seed's DIY toolkit, it's a revolutionary way for you to secure your seed words on a titanium plate, not just a piece of paper. With professional metal stamping tools, you can easily hammer your seed words into a commercial grade titanium. They've been doing this for 13, they've been doing titanium for 13 years. Now it's fire resistant up to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's off paper. It's completely secure for you to keep your seed words on. Again, fire resistant, crush proof, non-corrosive, and immune to the passage of time, unlike paper. Each letter is deeply impressed into a solid plate, not just the dots like other uh, competing plates. So it's guaranteed to not lose pieces or have varying materials. So secure your hardware wallet with a titanium stamp seed seed and safeguard your Bitcoin for generations to come. So thanks. Let's get back to the video.
Right. We ask ourselves this question every single day. Like, are we crazy or, or are we every just day. right? Uh, Abdi, and I, Abdi and I talk a lot. For anyone that doesn't know, we are constantly talking. Uh, I think that's the only way that we do, we do what we do. But Luke, I don't know. I don't know. I, we don't talk as much. I mean, I think we might in the future. Uh, if you know, you oh, know. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but um, but uh, yeah, why, why, are you, why are you so sure? Why are you so sure? Yeah, well, that's that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. You know, some a, a lot of people think that I'm uh, lost my mind because I'm speaking such absolutes, and they're such bold claims. It's like it's so bold, and it's so ridiculous, and I'm speaking with such conviction. It's like, like who is it? I mean, it's like okay, what do I know? I'm I'm a 24 year old, just you know, what, what do I? But the, the reason I speak with such absolutes is because I've just thrown every ounce of my thought at this and i'm not saying that i'm any smarter or less smart than anyone else it's just that i've thrown my brain at it and i can't find a way at which this isn't the most probable outcome perhaps it's not the outcome that occurs perhaps there's a 51 percent chance i'm right and 100 different scenarios in which it doesn't you know but I, I think it's more probable than not that this is the case and why and why yeah why do i think that well what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is just a piece of information. And history shows that information is really difficult to destroy. The Bible has survived. You know, I was just in Israel last December and you know, I visited the, I visited Qumran and the Dead Sea, yeah, where, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and all that. And it's amazing that basically a bunch of goat herders and, you know, people from the ancient world were able to meticulously preserve the Hebrew scriptures uh, that you know now is the Bible uh, for thousands of years with their primitive ancient technology, and it's like well, with Bitcoin, it's a similar idea in that it's just information, it's just you know lines of code, and as long as somebody somewhere is keeping that code alive, and you know has their computers plugged in, mining it, you know running our nodes, you know all that, keeping the network alive, it's like that's incredibly difficult to kill, and so yes, it's possible that. Bitcoin does not gain mass adoption, but Bitcoin is just an idea. Bitcoin is just information. And number one, I think it's a very safe assumption to assume that if enough people care about the information, the information will survive. And number two, that the best idea wins. Like every time, you know, the, the internet was a better idea than newspapers because the internet has, again, talking about exponentials, hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of millions of times of more applications and connections than newspapers ever could and you know it's it's the same thing with every other paradigm in history locomotives were a better idea than horses horses were great horses were the pinnacle of technology for thousands of years until suddenly we found a way to manifest the idea of transporting massive amounts of people massive amounts of resources across space via the locomotive and and the best idea won out and so why am i so absolute in bitcoin it's like well assuming that information survives and assuming it's the best idea then it, it should just take over everything and i'm very confident it's going to survive I'm, I'm most confident it's going to survive and i'm pretty confident that it's the best idea i mean wh what's the other answer guys like central silver bank digital currencies <laughs> central bank digital currencies like like what shiba i mean like, I mean, gold is the best idea besides Bitcoin, and it's a it's a really good idea. You know, I'll give the gold bugs their credit. Like, bit, like, like, excuse me, gold has worked for thousands of years, and it's a really good idea. But why has gold not been transacted with for hundreds of years? It's like, well, we just can't we just can't do it anymore. You know, you can't have an analog, uh, you know, metal um, keep up with the velocity of money we need in the modern world. You know, transactions are so small, so instantaneous, and they're so numerous that it just seems like an inferior idea to Bitcoin. And that's not saying it's a bad idea. It just seems that Bitcoin's a better idea. And so anyway, given those two assumptions, I don't see any other outcome unless there's a better idea coming along, but it's been 14 years. No one's had a better idea. And I don't even know how, where to begin to think about a better idea. I don't know how you get better than perfect scarcity. Yeah, no, dude, <laughs> beautifully said.